Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome back to PMF IS Current Affairs Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik, and this is your last part of the test number three. Now, in this particular video, we are going to discuss the last twenty questions, which is from eighty-one to hundred, and we are going to give you uh, the context of the questions, how to approach them, and of course, these are going to be ultimately very important questions for your, for your upcoming prelims exam. So let let us get started. But before I discuss the question, there is one very important announcement for every UPSC aspirant out there. If you are looking for a quality test series, I would recommend you to check out the PMF IS test series. It is available at a very special price of just four ninety nine, and we are providing you ten very high quality tests, which is going to include one thousand high quality MCQs. prepared by the team of experts so do check it check the link below in the description it's a special price it is going to get expired soon before it get expired do check out the uh, special price of the test series and do solve these questions it will elevate your chances of clearing the upsc exam now the question number 81 which was asked in your test number 3 is with respect to the mediation act 2023 now as the question straight away says uh this is a very dedicated question on one particular act but we can still solve a lot of question based on our understanding of the topic not just um, uh, you know given the fact of the question but also what exactly we know behind that particular topic talking about the mediation act what exactly the word mediation what first things come to your mind when you when you say the word mediation it simply means there are two disputed parties and i am the third person who is going to mediate between the two right that is what you call as mediation well exactly that makes us understand that we have lots of alternative dispute resolutions which is in short called adrs now adr include many modes um, uh, you know in, in our uh, in our whole system of justice adr is about setting the dispute outside the court without involving the regular court and that includes the arbitration method where you we have one arbitrator we have negotiation method mediation is one such method and of course we have the lok adalat lok adalat is something we already have discussed if you remember uh, in the last uh, uh, video we have discussed about the lok adalat now when it comes to mediation mediation is a voluntary process it's a very important word is voluntary nobody is going to impose on you it is not a, like a mandatory process if you if you are not interested in mediation you directly want to go, go to the court you can go there is no problem but this is one option that we have as a voluntary option in which parties try to settle the disputes with the assistance of an independent third person and we call that person as mediator now this mediation act as the name says mediation act it means it tries to allow the parties to settle the their civil cases and commercial disputes please understand every type of dispute cannot be settled with respect to adrs i mean there are certain categories only about for which we can uh, go with the adr process if it is it's a, it's a high crime thing or some criminal offenses there you have no option but to go to the regular court but in the case of certain cases we have we have the option of going for the adr process in mediation act it allows the settlement for civil cases for commercial disputes that we can solve through mediation and please understand that this is a pre litigation state pre litigation means uh, uh, before filing the actual case in the court and this whole process is voluntary like i like i say you please understand adr can never ever be forceful adr can never ever be mandatory because in in our country we have a democratic setup and everyone has a right to go to the court it's just that we why why do we have adr process it is just that you know we are giving people an alternative rather than uh, going through the whole uh, process of the court system because we already have lot of pending cases in the court the pendency level is so high and you know uh the whole process of the judicial system is very tedious to avoid that whole big channel this is a quick fix kind of solution that's why we have it but it is all voluntary nobody is going to force on you now please understand one more thing that ultimately when it comes to the mediation act as per as mediation act 2023 is concerned the overall areas that it include is going to be the family dispute the community conflicts civil dispute the commercial disputes and it applies 
to all the domestic parties as well as the international mediations as well. Now this is a key point that you have to remember. It is not just restricted to the domestic parties, even international mediations are taken care under this. But please understand, Mediation Act also specifies which particular kind of cases are not fit for the mediation, which are excluded. They are never going to be part of the mediation process. For example, if there is any criminal prose prosecution, there is no mediation for that purpose. If there are tax disputes or there are disputes under the Competition Act, if there is a dispute with respect to allegations of fraud or forgery, if you have claims against the minor or person of unsound mind, then there is no scope of mediation. Similarly, if there is a dispute that affects the right of the third party, which is not a part of mediation proceeding, then also mediation is not an option. And also there is a time limit for that mediation. It's not like you, you uh, uh, hung up with the mediation process for a long time. No, there is a time limit for that. Every mediation process need to be completed within 120 days, like four months, the mediation should be over. We don't want long pending cases in the mediation. Otherwise, what is the benefit of having the media? If the pendency uh, or the long process is to be followed, then why people will go to the mediation, right? So there is a time limit with the, within four minutes, you have to solve the case, you have to mediate. But at, at, a, at certain cases, if with the consent of the parties, if it is required, 120 days can be extended further for two months, that is 60 days. Means the maximum limit is uh, six months, 180 day. Now that is the maximum limit. Normal cases within four months can be extended to six months, but not, not more than that. And please also remember one thing, whatever is the mediation settlement agreement says, if you want to challenge the mediation verdict, if you want to challenge whatever the mediator has given as its verdict, that challenge is to be done within 90 days from the date of the receipt of the copy. If you have any objection, if you're not satisfied, please go and appeal and challenge that within 90 days. After that, it cannot be even challenged. I hope with respect to mediation, you are clear. Now, what? Let, let's see what the question was asking. The question was with respect to the act and the very first statement is absolutely correct. As the name says, it is about settling the civil and commercial dispute. Remember, if the question would have included the word criminal, then clearly this statement should be incorrect. But now it is correct statement. Now look at the second statement. It says it makes the pre-litigation compulsory. No, cannot, can never be. ADR can never be a compulsion. It is a voluntary thing. Now please look at the third statement. It clearly says mediation act include all these conflicts, but not the text disputes. Yeah, it does not include the text, the, uh, text disputes. Text disputes are to be settled by the judicial process itself, not by mediation act. So second is incorrect, first, third, third and fourth are absolutely correct. Be very careful with the days, you know, UPSC may trick you by the number of days. But this is too factual, this kind of things are too factual. So you really um, have to be on your toes while solving these questions. You really have to be aware of the act because <coughs> Second statement, I can still predict with my common sense, but but if there are specific things asked in the question, you can't really uh, make a guesswork in that case, right? So here, uh, the answer is only three. This question, I would say it, it, it was a tough question. Uh, you can risk it if you, if you have read it once. Otherwise, it should be skipped because the things are too technical and too factual. You really do not have any scope of, uh, you know, doing any guesswork in that case. The question number 82 is with respect to the SID, which stands for Skill India Digital. Now, this is important. Now, Skill India is something we have hearing this word since 2015 a lot. Skill India is a is a branding that we have done, uh, you know, for, for all the kind of trainings that we are giving to the youngsters of the country and which is very much required because ultimately what makes a human a human resource is the education, the healthcare, and the skills. So Skill India Digital is a very important mission uh, for our country and especially uh, given the case that we have so many youngsters in our country, right? Now, the question is with respect to this Skill India Digital platform. Let's try to understand first few facts about it, then we'll come back. So ultimately, why this is in news? This question was asked to you because the uh, Union Minister of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship, please try to remember the ministries. Ministries are very, very important. 
it is the ministry of skill development and entrepreneurship they have launched skill india digital and it is built by the national skill development corporation so remember the sid remember the ministry and do remember the particular corporation that has built up the whole uh, skill india digital now what exactly is the work of this skill india digital you know it act as a bridge between the employee and the employers it's a it's a digital bridge which is going to connect the requirements and the and the skills of the two sides the employee and the employers ultimately india's digital public infrastructure is going to uh, this this particular skill india digital is going to serve as india's digital public infrastructure for all these purpose be it skill development education employment entrepreneurship system everything is going to be pushed up by utilizing the skill india digital that is that's why it is considered to be a bridge uh, between the requirements of the employee and the employers now also the skill india uh, develop digital it integrates the training programs as well of uh, central government as well as the state governments right now it has more than 264 skilling courses with almost 42000 plus course, uh, centers and they are available under this one particular platform so it it is it also deals with the training programs of central and the state government this is important some platforms are only taking care of the central government some are exclusively for the state but it, it is more integrated integral uh, thing this this platform is more comprehensive because skill is something that you need to have the integration of both the best of central government and the state government no but one thing is very unpredictable about this particular mission you have just learned that the national skill development corporation it is the one that has built up the skill india digital right? no problem but do you know the national skill development corporation it 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 seems as if this is it should be under ministry of skill development but that is not the nsdc which is a not for profit public limited company it is actually set up under the ministry of finance and it is set up as private public private partnership model in 2008 now this is very unique i mean obviously nobody could have guessed that because as the name says national skill development corporation it looks very obvious it must be under the ministry even i don't understand why government does so many confusing things if the name says skill development it should be under the skill development ministry isn't it but right now it is what it is since it's a public private partnership 49% share is with the government but 51% share lies with the <coughs> private sector okay now if you if you come to the question like here all the four statements are absolutely correct you have absolutely no problem so every, all the four uh, four statements were definitely correct uh, now be careful about the ministries now here in this particular case ministries are correct but be very careful and especially with this skill development corporation you have to be very careful it is under ministry of finance do not get into the trap of the upsc that it is under any other ministry in this case answer should be d a b 1 2 3 3 all are correct this again was a tough question it was a tough one you could have you could have risked it but i again would say uh, if you have if you are clueless about it because every every question everything was very much typical factual based so rather than taking blind risk you should skip because there are other questions which are easy and that you could have easily attempted so do not go with because ultimately your objective should be qualifying the uh, cut off not like you are supposed to uh, you know get 160 170 marks there is no point you have to cut off, you have to go through the cut off that is the main objective next question 83 was with respect to the national quantum mission what this national quantum mission is about now this is something very important now before i get into the detail of it now look you have already discussed with me the quantum computing so one thing i can guess from this word national quantum mission just uh, recall your memory and try to try to recall where you have read this word oh this is quantum mission should be should be related to quantum computing that makes sense now if you think of the quantum uh, computing <coughs> think about it this is a quantum mission now what quantum mission is going is supposed to be a quantum mission supposed to be aiming at developing scientific research development supposed to be creating a vibrant quantum technology ecosystem 
I mean, just by applying a common sense, I can say, oh, this statement actually looks correct. Otherwise, what is the, that is the sole purpose of all the missions. They want to push the R&D, research and development in any particular sector. Now, only problematic thing in this question was the time period. Now, as the question says, the National Quantum Mission launched by Department of Science and Technology is correct, but the time period is not correct. It is not from 2022 to 2028. The time period is actually different. It is from 2023, 24 to 2030, 31. So time period has a problem. So though there are very less questions which have these kind of problems, but you actually have to be careful. If the question is asking you to be focused on the time period, you should not ignore it at all. In this case, the answer was only B because first statement is wrong just because of this. <coughs> I would say this was a medium level kind of question and you could have attempted it by um, or at least you should have risked it because second statement is very simple and can be related to the mission itself. The only problem was with respect to the first statement, right? Now talking about this national quantum mission, yes, remember the name of the department. It is Department of Science and Tech that has launched this mission and be very careful with the time period with, with the star mark. Ultimately, everything else is very obvious. We already have discussed the quantum technologies, what this mission is going to do. This, this mission is going to intermediate uh, scale quantum computers. We are going to make under this particular mission. We are aiming for 50 to 1000 physical qubits. That is the, our aim that we want to create. We also want to create a satellite based secure quantum com uh, communication under this particular mission. We are aiming for long distance secure quantum communications. We want to unlock the intercity quantum key distribution over 2000 km and we are also planning for multi node quantum networks. But of course, this all is still a future technology because we have not yet cracked the quantum computing technology at, uh, as a total one. Right? We are still uh, doing that. <coughs> question number 84. Now what this question was, this question is about Amazon Future Engineer Program. Now please look at the statement. Now look at the question. This initiative, this program says Amazon Future Engineer. Can you guess? I mean if, if you have to guess about, okay, who is going to be Future Engineer? Of course you can never ever get the right answer here. <coughs> maybe you will think about okay you uh, there are chances that you know looking at the engineer probably first thing you would have thought was the department of science and technology because that seems to be dealing with engineer but that is not the right answer second thing you may think oh it may be about higher education but that is also not the case a uh, future engineer may re uh, look relatable little bit with the ministry of skill development but last choice that I can think of is exactly the right answer in this case. The last thing I would think is the Ministry of Tribal Affairs, isn't it? Isn't it shocking? This was a googly question. Simple but tough should be skipped at all cost if you have no clue because in this case you have more chances of going wrong because you will, I know how your mind will work looking at the engineer but actually the least possible thing that you can think of is the right answer. <laughs> it is the Ministry of Tribal Affairs which, which has actually launched this mission, Amazon Future Engineer Program. Now, since it is the Ministry of Tribal Affairs, now you can understand, oh, it, it must have to do something with the tribal population of our country. Now, what exactly the details are, please look it very carefully. National Education Society for Tribal Students under Ministry of Tribal Affairs in collaboration with Amazon India, that's why the name is Amazon Future Engineer and along with Learning Link Foundation. These are the three stakeholders. They have launched the second phase of Amazon Future Engineer program. And this, this program is designed specially for the Eklavya model residential schools. Do expect a question on the EMRF as well because recently, last year in fact, these kind of schools, they were very much in the news. India has launched many Eklabe model residential schools last year. So please prepare it for the for further execution on that. Now what exactly Amazon Future Engineer program is going to do? It's a comprehensive program. Why comprehensive? Because this program is going to take care 
of childhood to career program it is going to nurture the children right from the starting to the end of the career and this is specially designed for tribal communities and that is why it makes sense why ministry of tribal affairs is included ultimate aim of amazon future engineer program is to increase the access to the computer science education for the children and young adult that belong to tribal communities and those specially who are lacking the opportunities in the technical field in the science and tech field and that is why the name is given amazon future engineer but in this case risk uh, it, there was a huge risk if you if you guys would have simply <coughs> guess, guess this particular question now looking at the question number 85 the question was with respect to promotion of the tribal products for the north east region okay uh, now this is this is a very interesting question one thing let me tell you before i uh, begin any any detailing of the question since i'm talking about the tribal product forget about everything i'm talking about the tribal product scheme just get one thing straight in your head whenever you are going to market sell the tribal products in our country the best way or the best channel that the tribal products are going to the market is via trifed trifed is a tribal federation which is taking care of all the commercialization of the tribal products and trifer trifed works under ministry of tribal affairs just get one thing in your head you have to talk about the commercializing the tribal products you have to sell the those products products in the market it is always to be done by ministry of tribal affair and for that purpose they have this so called tribal cooperative marketing development federation of india called tribe this there is no exception to that so first statement has to be correct at all cost second thing very important since it says this is a central sector scheme i mean you may be a little doubtful here if it was a central sector scheme or if it was a central uh, sponsored scheme now this is one thing that you may be a little doubtful we'll talk about that later and look at the question itself says this is about the travel products of north east region it is not specifying any uh, re, uh, any state when you think of the term north east region you should always think about the seven sisters and their one brother one brother is the sikkim sikkim is that one brother and the seven sisters are arunachal assam manipur meghalaya mizoram nagaland tripura the seven north eastern states of india so the only problem i had was was with this particular statement may it may look little tough but first and third are something you can easily solve <coughs> i am not sure about the second statement but if i am sure about one and three i will get i am going to get my answer straight away because i want one and three in the answer so this all them all of them can be eliminated easily understood i am not sure about the uh, of the scheme it's not important you know the scheme in detail or not is not important are you able to figure out the right answer or not that is more important so this particular question was in my opinion it was a medium one but something you could have attempted easily by understanding the approach of the question in this case all the three are right answer the answer has to be d 1 2 and 3 okay so remember about the tri trifid remember about uh, uh, the eight eight northeastern states <clears throat> and yes it's a central sector scheme means the whole funding is to be done by the uh, union government of india okay now if you want to learn detail about the trifid in your pdf we have mentioned the details of the trifid please go and read about it it's very important next question is a hard core topic of polity the question is with respect to reservation and you are given specific constitutional amendment act now i have seen the last few years upsc is playing games with the number of the amendment acts for example in the last year mains 2023 mains there was a question where they have asked about uh, there was a question about like 100th constitutional amendment of india or 101 something like something was like that so now it is important for you to remember the particular number of that constitutional amendment act sometimes even in mains and the prelims the questions are going to talk about these amendment acts directly 
okay now here in this question it was 104th 105th constitutional amendment act <coughs> keep these two things aside now it's since it's talking about the resolution look at the last statement first it says women representation in lok sabha has increased it was 5% in the first lok sabha first lok sabha in india was 1952 and now it is 15% in the current lok sabha which is right now in 2019 it this this statement looks absolutely correct of course from 1952 the number of re uh, women representation has increased so i have no doubt about the statement number 3 but again first and second is something i have to think about it now please we'll read about first and uh, 101st and 105th uh, amendment now what this 104th constitutional amendment is about now please remember this amendments are important <coughs> 104th amendment act was passed in 2009 where it terminated the reservation for anglo indian community you know lok sabha used to have 545 total number of seats out of 543 the two seats were reserved for the anglo indian community now this amendment act they had terminated these reservations and now lok sabha has 543 seats as of now and it also fixed the same amendment fixed 2030 is going to be the year as a deadline year where they say we are going to end the reservation for sc and st lok sabha and state legislative assemblies now i am sure you are aware right now so far in indian uh, lok sabha and uh, the vidhan sabhas the sc st community has a certain reservation so so that we can improve their political representation right but this act wants to terminate that after 2030 <clears throat> remember article 2 uh, 334 of indian constitution that talked about reserving seat of uh, the sc st anglo indians you may have this question coming as an mcq as well maybe they will ask you 334 is about with respect to what or they may ask you <coughs> the reservation of the seat of sc st anglo indians is under which particular article they may ask you both ways but again one thing is important the question was about 105th 5th act but please remember it was actually 106th amendment act that reserves and that was passed in 2023 recently last uh, last year only 106th constitutional amendment act was passed where we reserved one third means 33% seats were reserved for the women now what government is doing rather than giving reservation based on caste the government is willing to give reservation based on gender okay and government is going to give that 33% reservation to the women of india in in the lok sabha as well as vidhan sabhas for the next 15 years not as a permanent one but for the next 15 years and after that there will be reassessment of the situation okay and in this particular act there is no separate quota for obc obcs are not included in that plus the 33% seats also going to apply uh, apply for sc st categories i mean you cannot claim that my if there is a if there is a woman uh, she cannot say that i am going to take up the 33% quota and uh, schedule caste schedule tribes are going to get another quota if there is a sc st woman then that quota is going to be included and if you look at the question now if you look at the question first statement is absolutely correct but please remember it is not 105th amendment act it was 106th amendment act and that was also passed in 2023 that has reserved the seats now the, the, the this particular bill is also called the women Emp political empowerment bill right so second statement looks wrong here first and third being correct answer is only two so you have to be careful about especially in the last couple of years especially in the last two years whatever new amendment government has passed so be very careful with that guys hai na that is important i would say this question was a tough one you could have taken a bit of risk but yes it was a tough one you have to be very careful and very sure about the amendments it's a fact based question you can't really ignore <coughs> next question was with respect to 
बासमती राइस विच स्टेटमेंट इज करेक्ट बिफोर आई गेट ऑन टू एनी डिटेल प्लीज लुक एट द स्टेटमेंट नंबर थ्री आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट बासमती राइस फ्यू डेज बैक इन इन वन ऑफ द वीडियोज वी हैव वी हैव अंडरस्टूड दैट दिस बासमती which is a geographical there is a there is a fight over geographical indication of uh, basmati it is grown in uh, northern states of india and basmati is not the name of the indian rice only even even uh, uh, farmers of the pakistan that they grow rice they also call it basmati now the third statement says india got the gi tag for basmati in 2020 along with pakistan but that is not the case india has not yet received basmati because pakistan objected that basmati also belongs to us you can't give basmati tag to india so third statement is absolutely wrong and we know about it because we have not yet got any basmati rice gi tag so eliminate the statement number 3 that's it use the elimination method. i have picked up the most easier line and that has solved the problem and my right answer is p in this particular case without even getting in the detail of the question i have got my answer to get on to the details now yes basmati is a premium rice variety we agree but is it is it cultivated in southern parts of the country no basmati is not about the southern part of the country where basmati is grown basmati is cultivated at the himalayan foothills in india the states of jammu kashmir himachal punjab haryana delhi up uttarakhand they all have this one wonderful variety called basmati rice india is accountable for two third of the global supply of basmati rice the second largest supply is done by pakistan but india has a two third uh, uh, holding share and recently basmati rice was even more into the news because five new varieties of basmati rice they were developed by indian agriculture research institutes and that is why basmati was too much into the news last year okay now in this question i would say this was a very easy question very easy even the first statement even you could have applied the other way also we know about the basmati it is not the southern part at all because basmati is something we all have heard in the northern belt of india right <laughs> you could have eliminated that also but eliminating 3 had solved my whole purpose very easy question i think everyone should have attempted that easily without any problem just a bit of common sense and you are good to go next question is again a problem is question <clears throat> i have searched a lot i have not found the full form of the term in mobile app i have searched a quite websites but the there is no full form of the mobile app called aid this is simply name of a mobile app it could be anything could be weather forecasting could be electronic trade portal can be diet benefit transfer can be crop insurance enrollment right answer is b crop insurance enrollment it's a very latest app that we have uh, launched in india with respect to the crop insurance enrollment but from the name it is very hard difficult to predict it was a tough question don't take the risk in these kind of question because there are there is only 25% chances you are going to get it right and 75% chances you are going to get it wrong <coughs> talking about the aid app it is developed to streamline the enrollment process for the farmers in india's very important crop insurance scheme like pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana and the second one being restructured weather based crop insurance scheme so every time the aid app is going to help the farmers and the the administration to streamline the enrollment process enrollment process is to be done for all the new farmers who want to get attached to these particular crop insurance schemes the main purpose of this app is to revolutionize the enrollment process bringing directly it to the doorstep of farmers making the whole process easy by the way right it they want to make a doorstep process so that more and more uh, farmers are encouraged to be a part of the the crop insurance schemes of our country that is the whole purpose right but this question i i do not think that you could have predicted unless until you have read it carefully next question is with respect to the green hydrogen okay <clears throat> let us assume we have we don't have great idea we have not read about green hydrogen in detail first of all so this is this is a must prepare topic 
I I would recommend you please read more and more about this because it's a, it's a very hot topic of the UPSC. It's a very hot topic. Everyone is talking about the green hydrogen mission. India has launched about green hydrogen mission. Everyone is talking that green hydrogen is going to be the future fuel of the world, and so many things are going on. Just apply your common sense and look for the right answer here without even getting into the detail. The word is green hydrogen. Green. Why? Why any fuel? Why any fuel is going to be considered as a green fuel? Green fuel is the fuel that does not release any carbon as a byproduct. If it is releasing carbon, it cannot be called green. Green means eco-friendly. The word green is eco-friendly, right? Should not be producing any byproduct, especially the carbon. Yes. <clears throat> In case of green hydrogen, there is absolutely no. Carbon uh, byproduct. The only byproduct of the green hydrogen is water, water and water vapor. Water and water vapor. These are the only two byproducts that are given by green hydrogen. <coughs> Second statement is correct, but look at the first statement. Please. It says green hydrogen produced by splitting water into hydrogen oxygen using electrolysis process. But the problem is it says. it is powered by non renewable energy can have you ever heard have you ever heard the non renewable energy like coal like crude oil like natural gas can you ever think that these technologies are going to be used for producing anything green if there is a green fuel green technology the the usage has to be with respect to the renewable sources there has to be which renewable i don't know forget about it but the only thing i can think of is only renewable sources are going to make the thing as green fuel or something right <clears throat> second statement is correct first must be wrong at all the cost now in this question you don't have to be a genius on green hydrogen to give the answer i have just applied my common sense i have picked out the main keywords and i have i've solved my question with a very ease answer has to be b for me this question was easy something you could have attempted very easily now talking about green hydrogen a little bit i have i have discussed it very very uh, uh, in uh, many lectures but still to give you a bit idea about the green hydrogen see hydrogen has always been a, a possible uh, you know fuel for our future but the problem is hydrogen on our planet hydrogen never occurs freely it is always it exists as a combined with other element for example water now this is probably one of the most common method that we have to produce hydrogen from the water and what is the best way to to, uh, to do that so let's take you have taken some water and in this h2 or the water now you are going to uh, pass the electricity the moment you are going to pass the electricity the process is called electrolysis <clears throat> electricity is passed from the water the process is electrolysis and this uh, electricity this current is going to split the molecule of h2o and we are going to get hydrogen as a separate fuel we are extracting hydrogen by splitting the water through the process of electrolysis but now the question and why it is it should be called as green is decided by by what source that electricity which electricity which is passed that electricity was produced by which particular source if that electricity was passed using the coal means it was a thermal power electricity then such hydrogen is to be called as brown hydrogen if i have used solar energy wind energy something renewable if i have used to create that energy then only i will call the hydrogen produced as a green hydrogen if natural gas was utilized for electricity production should be termed as grey hydrogen right and if this if there is a uh, this is natural gas without carbon sequestration and if it is natural gas with carbon sequent sequestration with low carbon then it is to be called as blue hydrogen so blue and green blue and grey both associates with natural gas but all the above are going to be bit pollute uh, you know it's going to be uh, emitting some carbon but the green hydrogen has absolutely zero carbon emission so carbon sequestration is not needed because i am not going to emit any anything 
because ultimately green hydrogen has only two byproducts that is water and water vapor and so that I have no problem with that right so please remember the colors of the hydrogen depends on the kind of uh, fuel which is utilized to create that uh, you know <coughs> electricity question number 90 very tough it looks but it is not it talks about the Kutanad package what is Kutanad package I know I have heard a lot about the Kutanad what is Kutanad we know that it is a wetland in Kerala all I need is this information that's it if Kutanad is a wetland first let me eliminate any option which is non relevant to wetland what could Kutanad package what it could be is it going to be financial aid program for agriculture modernization in coastal India? No. Can it be about ecosystem restoration project, preserving the biodiversity about mangroves? No, not at all. Only two options could be there. Maybe the Kutanath package, maybe it is about comprehensive plan, mitigating impact of urbanization on wetlands because the word wetland is there. Or <coughs> this package could be about Conserving, developing the Alapuze and Kutanad wetlands in Kerala. As far as my understanding is concerned, I connect more with D as the option because that package seems to support the wetland in a very simple and comprehensive manner. So I, if I would have to guess this the right answer, my answer has to be D and that is again the right answer. Itself. Probably the second could be right in some way, but first the, the major package is about supporting, conserving, developing the wetlands. Now why this wetland is so special, I'm going to tell you. But as far as my understanding says, this was a medium question, but could be attempted by understanding the meaning and applying little bit of the common sense. Now what is this Kutanath package? Please understand. So now at least you know that Alapuzi and Kutanath, these are the two wetlands. And where they belong, they belong to the state of Kerala. States are important, wetlands are very important. And do read about all the 80 sites, which sites? Ramsar sites that India has right now as wetlands of international importance. Do read about them. Talking about the Kutanath package, it was the architect of this package was MS Swaminathan. Swaminathan is already very much in news because of the MSPs and the farmer protests which is going on right now. So I recommend you guys do read about the C2 formula for the MSP. Do read about the C2 plus 50% formula which is again given by MS Swaminathan. So he is a person everything and, and because recently he has also got a Bharat uh, Ratan. Swaminathan Sahab has got a Bharat Ratan as well. So I am going to expect questions with respect to the work of Swaminathan coming into the UPSC exam for sure. So do read about the person and his work and his all important contribution to the uh, to the agriculture of India. Everything is very important. The Kutanath package is about spending almost 1800 crore rupees as proposed by MS Swaminathan Research Foundation. And it says, you know, we are we have to conserve this particular wetland. Why it is so important? Because these Kutanad wetland agriculture system, it is world famous. It is the only system in India that actually favor rice cultivation below the sea level. Below the sea level, the rice cultivation is done. And that too by creating, by the land for that purpose is created artificially by draining the delta swamps into the brackish water. It's a very, very special ecosystem to cultivate rice in the state of Kerala. And that is why the wetlands are so important and needs to be conserved. Make sense? <coughs> Talking about the rice, let's get on to the next question, which is about International Rice Research Institute called IRRI. Now, <clears throat> again, let us say you have not read this question. Now, the question is about International Rice Research Institute and you have absolutely no clue about this uh, institute, right? This, excuse me, guys. <coughs> now it says international research research uh, rice research institute my keyword is rice and research keep these two things in mind 
Let's read the question first. It says, it is an international agriculture research training organization. The name itself says it is. But then it says it is headquartered in Indonesia only. Rice is something. The rice which is called paddy. This is a culture which is very famous in South Asia, South East Asia, East Asia and many other parts of the world. How come it is possible that paddy is a kind of cultivation which is world famous? How it is possible that it is going to have headquarters in only one particular region? And if that region is there, why not it is India? Indonesia only makes me suspicious. First of all, only word makes me suspicious. Then it says there is only one headquarter, which is again not fair for me. I am not agreeing with this. Make sense? Then again, the look at the second statement. I'm talking about rice, rice, you know. And it says it has no regional center in South Asia. Come on. South Asia, you have you have Sri Lanka, Maldives, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh. Can you think of Bangladesh without rice? Can you think of India without rice? Pakistan without rice? We are the country, we are the, we are the region consuming one of the largest quantities of rice. And how come it has no regional center in South Asia make no sense to me. So I am going to eliminate these two for sure because these two statements look very suspicious. Now look at the third statement and I have no idea. I'm, I have not read about IRRI. I am just applying my common sense. Then it says it is one of the agriculture research centers in the world that form the consortium of international agriculture research center. That makes sense. Yes, probably it could be. What else it is supposed to do? It is supposed to make some platform for international research about agriculture and paddy and rice. That, that what is supposed to. <coughs> then it says the question number, the statement number four says it was the effort of IRRI in India during 1960s that had sufficient impact on agriculture productivity. Again, I have no idea because for that you need to know when the research was found, you know, when it was found or something. But at least I have figured out my three statements. So I am in a position, though the question was a tough one, but I am in a position to take some risk because I have eliminated few of the statements. My only risk is statement number four, right? Now first learn about it, read about it. I have talked about the approach. Talking about the IRRI, it is independent non-profit research institution, yes. Its headquarter actually lies in Los Benos, which is in Philippines. And it has offices in 17 rice producing countries across Asia and Africa. So it is not Indonesia only. This institute was founded in 1960. So that connects it somewhere to the statement number four because this institute was actually founded somewhere around the time when green revolution was happening in India. It has a regional office in Varanasi. The statement uh, was that it has no uh, uh, regional office in any South Asia, which doesn't make us believe that, right? Yes, it, it actually helped, it, it contributed in the green revolution in India. It did. It was IRRI's semi-dwarf varieties of rice and famously we call them as IR8 variety that actually saved India from famines in 1960s. Their special dwarf variety of paddy, the rice, actually saved us and, and contributed towards the green revolution and thus food security of our country. Right? That makes sense. So if I go back to the question, now I have all the answers, I have all the knowledge. The answer is supposed to be Two only, which is correct, but I told you it was tough, but you are in a position to take a risk, the logic, common sense, right? <coughs> question number 92. <clears throat> the question was, with respect to some, there are four features which are given, okay? Some salient features are given. You are supposed to figure out which of these statements or which of the features are actually related to ENAM, which stands for Electronic National Agriculture Market. National Agriculture Market. Keep this word into the mind. This is your key word. Electronic National Agriculture Market. The key word is this. Okay. Forget about going into the detail. Forget about 
talking about everything. How you can think a market can become a national market? A market can become a national market means people from all across the country are in a position to sell and purchase goods at that particular point. Then only it can become a national market, yes. In this case, it, see, it, it looks like the second statement is correct. One license for the trader valid across all the market, that, that is probably you can think of something which is national. Yeah, one, li one license is required, right? Now, talking about the ENAM, so my answer must and must include option number two. So I can eliminate at least one option from here. Now, please look at the statement number four. If there, are, there is going to be multiple point levy, levy is a kind of market fees, it's a kind of tax that you have to pay, some kind of fee you have to pay. Is it going to make a market actually national market? Then why, why I have to pay multiple taxes? If, if it's a national market, I have to, I'm supposed to pay one single, because my license is one license is applicable for the market. I, I must be paying one single tax. That's it, right? So this seems to be wrong to me. <clears throat> I could have eliminated option number four as well. Now my only doubt is it could be A or it could be C. So this question was a, was a medium level. For some people it may be tough, but at least you are in a position to take a risk because now you have a 50-50 chance, okay? Look at the statement. Look at the question first. Look at the details of the question first. Talking about the ENAM. So what is this ENAM? Electronic National Agriculture Mission, uh, Market, sorry, National Agriculture Market, it's a pan-India electronic trading platform or portal that actually network the existing agriculture produce market committees. It was launched in 2016 and this is completely funded by Government of India, means it is central, uh, central sector scheme, 100% funding from the Government of India, but this is implemented by small farmer agri business consortiums under the ministry of agriculture farmer welfare now this particular information is going to be very important information <coughs> why what are the major features of this electronic national agriculture mandi or market this national e market platform is supposed to trans uh, is, is is supposed to make transparent sale transactions it is about better price discovery in the market for the farmer they they are supposed to get better price in the market and the whole the whole process is to be of more much more transparency that is why the feature number one seems to be correct that is liberal licensing if you want to make the market friendly if you want to make market more attractive you have to think about liberal licensing to whom to buyers and the traders even the commission agents and that liberal licensing is done by the state authorities without any precondition of physical appearance possessions of the shop in the market yard. Now first was the statement which was actually troubling us. Now rest of the statements we already have cracked, no? Of course if it is e-national market, uh, agriculture market, there has to be one license only for the harmonization of the quality standards. There has to be single point, not multi-point fee to make the things more attractive and yes the restriction of the jurisdiction is within the apmc market yard instead of geographical areas if you have this much information now i have my answer is in front of me for me it is only four statements should be wrong eliminate it right answer has to be a one two and three so this question was tough but we have made it something to take a risk upon right so yeah the answer has to be a in this particular case I know the questions are tough. UPSC is supposed to ask you tough questions, but are you in a position to hold your nerve at that moment until you are able to uh, talk about the right things, right? If you are able to get the right answer, that is your skill and that skill you need to develop more and more. Now the question number 93 was with respect to you are given some cultivation methods and uh, you are supposed to figure out if the definition is right, okay? <coughs> we can also solve this question with a lot of common sense. Now one cultivation method says geoponic, looks very scientific, very big method, but look at the word geo. Geo means soil. What geoponic could be? Geoponic means I am growing my plants in normal soil. Yes, 
because we know the word geo is earth, earth is soil. So geo word relates to the soil. Yeah, geoponic is growing plants in the soil. What could be aeroponic? Aero is air. Air means atmosphere, means environment. If I am growing my plant in mist environment without the use of the soil medium, we can call it aeroponic. Yes, the name itself says a lot. Then what could be hydroponic? Hydroponic means I am growing my plant using nutrient mineral solution. I am growing my plants in water without the soil. Like many people have the money plants in their glass bottles without soil, they flourish very well. So first three looks absolutely okay. But what about aquaponic? Now this may have troubled some of you. The word aqua, aquaculture, aquaponic is actually combination of two. Aquaculture plus hydroponic. Hydroponic we already have understood. Aquaculture is basically, you know, you are also cultivating fishes and you are, uh, you know, growing other marine species together along with the plant. You are not just growing the plants, but you are also cultivating fishes and other aquatic animals. That is aquaponics. So all four is absolutely correct. The question was more technical, but the names are simple and we could have figured out the answer as D. This question was a medium one, but something you can easily attempt in this case by simply translating the meanings very well. Now you have in front of you, you have this particular method where the roots of the plants are kept into the air and you just have to spray the nutrient water. That is called the um, aeroponic method. Aeroponic is done as an alternative to water intensive hydroponic systems. You don't have to have much water investment. You just have to spray the water nutrients to the roots. So roots are kept into the air. That's why aeroponic. This picture relates to hydroponic. You can see that the people are growing. All these plants are grown uh, in these particular water. And these waters are very nutrient rich waters. <clears throat> right? Why all of this was, uh, we are, why we are doing all of this? Because the climate is changing and we are developing technologies to, uh, to grow the plants and grow the trees in more resilient manner. That's why we are trying all this. And this picture is about the aquaponic. You can see the bottom you have the fish and other creatures, other aquatic animals and on the top you have the same hydroponic. So the combination of two is called aquaponic, right? Okay, moving ahead. Question number 94. The question is about cascading hazards. Now what is the meaning of cascading hazard? The word cascading, if you have heard of, of the word cascading, cascading is like a chain reaction like when one event or one disaster is following the other disaster it's like a chain reaction it's like a domino effect you see it's like a chain reaction that is the word cascading one disaster after the other keep this in mind and look at the statements what could ca cascading disaster could be isolated incidents unrelated to any primary triggering hazard no if it is unrelated, how can it be cascading? I can straight away uh, eject, uh, reject the statement. Then it says unpredictable events that have no specific cause could be, could not be. Secondary hazards triggered by human activities such as deforestation mining, it could be answer as well. Yeah. Caused by natural phenomena like earthquake, flood, some people will say, okay, this could be the answer as well. But what exactly cascading hazard is? The word cascading hazard is the secondary hazard also called chain reaction. Basically, if, if, if one particular hazard triggers the other hazards in a chain reaction sequence, we call them as cascading hazard. It can be caused by natural factor. For example, if I have an earthquake coming in this area, Earthquake is going to trigger, let's say there is an earthquake, earthquake is going to trigger a landslide. Because of the landslide, lot of rocks are coming down and those rocks are going to block the pathway. The rocks are also going to fill up the river nearby and because of the rock sed sediments falling into the uh, uh, river, there is going to be flooding situation. So earthquake, landslide followed by flooding, this is a cascading hazard one hazard promoting the other hazard okay now similarly it can be done by human activities also 
even human activities deforestation mining they can also start a sequence of the of the uh, uh, one disaster after the other so right answer in this case is supposed to be the secondary hazards triggered by human activities uh, de deforestation mining but at the same time cascading hazards can be natural too we have just seen the answer if the questions would have said that it is triggered by human activities only the answer would have been wrong answer is b this question was a medium one but <clears throat> you could have risked it by eliminating the other options i hope that statement is clear and what exactly uh, they are i have just discussed <coughs> next question is a tough one but i can still think of some solution to that now you have a species and you have their conservation status something which is very unique and typical to the upsc exam upsc ask you these kind of questions very commonly very oftenly in fact few years back these were the very kind of common kind of questions that used to come in the upsc exam right now talking about the species and their conservation status now i have i don't know about these uh, species let's say but at least the their geography says a lot now it says the manipur bush quail okay no idea himalayan quail no idea then jerdon kurzer to absolutely no idea but think about it majil like most of the himalayan uh, you know flora and fauna they are critically in critically endangered situations most of the himalayan uh, ecosystems are more fragile so most of the biodiversity in himalayan ecosystem is more of more or less critically endangered manipur is still untouched region north is still not that under heavy uh, human impact so definitely anything that is in manipur or all these states maybe they are there are there are chances they are supposed to be in a bit better condition that's why they are they supposed to be endangered but for the for the respect of the third one we have absolutely no idea right but at least i could have made the two things but that is still not going to solve my problem so talking about why these kind of questions appear now recently 75 endemic birds of india they were released on 108 foundation day of geological survey of india and out of that the three species that we have in the question they were in the news because we have not seen these species for many many decades like this manipur quail that you you are seeing on your screen this is manipur quail we have seen it last 1907 Jordan's quail was still recently, but 2009. And look at the Himalayan quail; it was last recorded sighting 1876. Now, talking about them, you can read about the detail. That is not problem. Like for example, Manipur quail; it belongs to endangered category. Yes, and where it is found? It is endemic to northeast India. That's why the name is Manipur a quail. It also be, it you can also find it uh, in parts of Bangladesh, right? That is important. Similarly, you have the second one calling uh, call as uh, the Himalayan quail. Now that is again you are going to find now very interestingly why it is critically endangered. Now this is fine. This is found only and only in Uttarakhand. If there is any species which is so restrictive in this geographical space, if it is so restricted in one particular area, that actually shows how critical and endangered that species could be. Yeah, that makes more sense. And this also belongs to the first schedule animal. The third one is also correct. We we have the uh, uh, we have this particular bird. Uh, it is endemic to Eastern Ghats. You we find it in Andhra and Telangana. It is also critically endangered. For for that purpose, yes, the answer is correct. But again, <coughs> these questions are not to be taken ta uh, not to be taken so easily. This was a tough one. because you are being asked very specific conservation status no idea please skip it don't take the risk because you have absolutely some logics may work but sometimes logic will not work as well because they are just predictions right here the answer has to be c because all three are absolutely correct if you look at the question number 96 now this question it was a uh, this question was a very interesting question the question was with respect to the penguins and their habitats we what what comes to our mind whenever we think of the of the of the word penguins what comes to our mind i always think about penguins and i always think about antarctica no 
the very first thing that comes to my mind be because we know in antarctica we have the penguins because in arctic we have the polar bears it's a very common saying na in arctic we have the polar bears and penguins uh, they stay in antarctica the first statement says the penguins live primarily in northern hemisphere looks very wrong because we know the majority of the penguins they belong to antarctica so first statement cannot be the right one if because if that would have been the case probably the polar bears would be feeding on the penguin species no <clears throat> statement number 2 says being ground nesting and unable to fly penguins are the birds probably they are the birds birds that can't fly that is what penguin is so that is why they are restricted to places without land predators and for that purpose antarctica is best for them because antarctica is comparatively don't have that many land predators right so second statement looks right in all the perspectives and first is the definitely wrong because we know that penguins have a home um, in antarctica not the no northern hemisphere they belong to southern hemisphere answer is in front of me answer is supposed to be d one incorrect two is correct so this question was easy one i think everyone must have att attempted this question going into the detail why recently penguins were in so much news because recently the emperor penguin which is one of the most important penguins their colonies they had seen total breeding failure because of the sea ice loss the major breeding ground these emperor penguins they majorly live in antarctica's belling bellingshausen sea region now this maybe you have a separate mcq on this like these days upsc is asking a lot of questions on places in news na so upsc may ask you the question that okay tell me where is this bellingshausen sea region lies so you must write it belongs to the antarctica region or you can write at that this belongs to southern ocean if the ocean is being asked you can write as southern ocean southern ocean is sometime also called as antarctic ocean but more technically it is correct if, if i call it as southern ocean that is that is the real name of that that water body so this sea region belongs to that particular area why it is in news because emperor penguins normally breed at this place this time the breeding failed due to the loss and why the ice loss again the problem is climate change and we are seeing is the global warming right so more and more global warming is happening the existence of penguins can come under threat because of that <coughs> okay now i told you that majority of the penguins live in southern hemisphere but there is one particular penguin called as the galapagos penguin they are the only species that you can found in north of the equator but majority of them they live in southern hemisphere i think that makes sense and uh, that is what you are supposed to keep into, into into the mind while talking about it question number 97 look at the word eco site and you are supposed to tell which statement best describes the word eco site okay let's say you are you are seeing this word for the first time and you are quite confused what eco site could be then think about some similar words think about the word suicide think about the word genocide think about the word homi site what is so common in that side 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 site i can think that okay these word side side has some negative connotation it is used for some kind of murder killing something like that no it talks about some kind of killing some kind of murder some kind of destruction something negative is what the side is attached to right side has some negative connotation that i can think please then read the statements study of ecological interaction with specific habit no cannot be the right answer there is nothing negative in that see to straight away wrong because it says it's a process of ecological revitalization are side cannot be positive it it is never going to talk about how to revitalize something no it's not about conservation cannot be conservation look at the first statement it says scientific term for extinction of the species due to natural causes may be the right answer may maybe c and d to definitely not the only confusion i have is between the two 
the right answer in this case is actually b ecocide is used as intentional destruction of ecosystem for economic gain that is why the word is ecocide means you are destroying the ecosystem killing ecosystem is ecocide right answer is a now this question was a tough one but we can still attempt it by applying our other common sense of suicide genocide homicide i can still make out that what could be the right answer <coughs> so the word ecocide actually means killing one's home or environment or for that matter ecosystem right now that is the real word so word ecocide is broadly used to understand or to uh, you know refer to mass damage and destruction of the ecosystem right that that's why the word is so important and that that makes us the makes it the right answer right <clears throat> now the question number 98 was with respect to nilgiri tahir now what this nilgiri tahir is about and be careful the answer is supposed to be not correct nilgiri tahir is it the state animal of tamil nadu yes it is it is the state animal of tamil nadu now please look at the second statement it says the mudumalai tiger reserve is the home to its largest population no it says they are endemic to western coastal area of india they are not so my answer is supposed to be d2 and 3 but before i talk about the uh, level of difficulty please look at the look at how nilgiri tahir is to be remembered nilgiri tahir is also known locally it is known as varaidu it is the state animal of tamil nadu and it is the only mountain animal in southern india that is actually a, a herbivorous mammal right and it is among the 12 species which is found in india that is the only one that lives in mountain so nilgiri mountains are very important area of its habitat please remember when it when when you talk about nilgiri tahir they are actually as the name says nilgiri tahir they are endemic to nilgiri hills only at present the uh, it is limited to western ghats they don't belong to western coastal plains you will find them into western ghats in the state of kerala and tamil nadu it is the iravikulam Irav national park in annamalai hills that has its largest population not the madumalai it is iravikulam national park having the largest population overall it is endangered category but still under schedule 1 and because tamil nadu's being uh, tamil nadu's national animal tamil nadu government had launched project nilgiri tahir for its conservation and that project was started in 2022 it is going to till 2027 okay now in this particular case i have my right answer that uh, uh, you are supposed to figure out not not correct one so answer has to be d this question was a medium one <coughs> you can take a risk in that uh, question but yes again if you are clueless please skip don't take the risk if you are clueless and be careful about if it is correct asking or not correct asking hai na that two things are important then you have the next question the ne uh, the next question 99 now you are supposed to figure out out of the four how many species are the birds and which species is not bird please look at this golden mashir i have read it so many times golden mashir is a fish it's not a bird at all the word mahashir means maha is a fish okay and the word sheer stands for sheer and that means tiger so among all the fishes this fish is considered to be a tiger fish okay so clearly it's not a bird so but other three the malabar grey hornbill nicobar megapod and bagun uh, leochala all the three are are the birds this question was a very fact based question mashir is a famous fish uh, that you could have eliminated but again uh, other options could have troubled you i would say this was a this was a tough question because there is no clue to apply any common sense and uh, something i don't recommend you to risk because these are tricky questions and maximum times you fall into the trap now in your pdf we have given all the required de uh, details about all these words i'm not going to repeat them because they are just factual uh, informations okay just read about uh, read in the pdf you have every information available on that the last question is something which is important the question number 100 was with respect to the flex fuel 
just focus on the word flex fuel that stands for flexible fuel vehicle please think about it normal vehicle okay what could be a flexible fuel vehicle the word flexible fuel actually makes us understand okay flexible fuel means it, there is not i can use multiple type of fuels no flexible fuel is like as per my availability i can use any fuel that i want right something that comes to our mind okay keep that into mind and then first let's learn about the flexible fuel and then we'll come back to the question the word flex fuel or flexible fuel means such vehicles are those vehicles that can run on more than one type of the fuel and that is why the word is flex fuel flexible fuel or it can not just more than one type of fuel even these vehicles can run on a mixture of the fuels now the most common type of that mixture or most common version that we have is a blending of petrol and ethanol or even methanol can be utilized for that purpose right now these kind of these engines in these kind of vehicles they can run either on 100% petrol or even either, either 100% uh, ethanol as well that's why they are called multiple uh, multi uh, you know uh, 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 multi uh, fuels can be used in that now right now in the world there is one particular company called toyota uh, kirloskar motor and they have designed a product called innova high cross it is the world's first prototype of the bs6 stage 2 electrified flex vehicle that is developed by this company and today this company claims that their their product their vehicle can run on petrol with more than 20 percent ethanol blending for that matter with time it is go it can also run 60 percent on electricity as an electrical vehicle and remaining time it can run as a fuel based or like a like a any diesel or like petrol or blending based uh, you know thing so yeah this is important now look at the question every statement i i have here is absolutely correct now this is a, this is a new emerging technology and uh, this is a very important technology that we are talking about answer has to be d <clears throat> is this question yes last statement was a troubling one but first and second is something i can figure out easily so in this case even if you are able to figure out now the only option you had were option a or d because first and second looks absolutely correct you can take risk in that situation it was a medium level question but yeah something that you can take a risk upon what exactly these bharat 6 or bs6 stage emission norms now that is something you should prepare separately i hope everyone is aware what exactly the meaning of bharat stage emission standards you must have heard the government says now you are supposed to use bs6 standard emissions what exactly that means Bharat stage emissions are actually the standards established by government of India to regulate the emission of the air pollutant from motor vehicle. Every engine, every car that you are driving, whatever your engine is emitting, government has a right to control or regulate that emission. For that matter, there are some standards which are prepared by government of India, implemented by Central Pollution Control Board that works under Ministry of Environment, Forest, Climate Change. Now India's Bharat stage, right now we are having, right now we are using Bharat stage 6 norms. After BS4, we have skipped BS5 and straight away we jump to BS6. Right now we are utilizing BS6 norms. Our Bharat standard norms are actually equivalent or they are based on the Euro 6 emission standards. Our Bharat standard, uh, Bharat stage uh, emission standards are, are inspired from the European standards as well and it actually monitors and regulates every time because every time a new bs uh, uh, norms come the vehicles they have to modify their uh, bodies they have to modify their engines because ultimately the engine uh, has a limit of all these pollutants at what particular level they are supposed to be emitted right so the major pollutants that are regulated by the norms include the particulate matter both 10 and 2.5 nitrogen oxide hydrocarbon carbon monoxide sulfur dioxide everything has a certain like like in bs6 norms you have you have a certain limit for, on everything and for that matter <clears throat> every car every car company every automobile company has to make certain amendments in their 
um, engines uh, for that matter, right? Now this is all about the question, uh, the, the 20 questions that we have discussed. That, that ends the discussion on test number 3. I hope you have enjoyed, you have learned a lot of things. What is your feedback? How much you have learned? And what is the quality of discussion that you have enjoyed? Do let me know in the comment section box. I have enjoyed uh, discussing them. I hope you have enjoyed learning them as well, right? Now best wishes for your upcoming UPSC exam. My name is Ashish Malik and don't forget to check out the test series of PMF IS available at a special price. Do check out the link in the description below. See you guys next time with test number 4. All the best. Jai Hind.